right here. Chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Again, as I said earlier, as I said earlier for our online folks, because of the changes in the Facebook platform, we're going to be uh, we won't be recording live, but we'll record it and then post it to Facebook after the service. Uh, it's just. It's technical stuff, and it's, anyway, that's just how we're gonna have to do it from here on out. So if you if you count on the service starting at a certain time, you'll have to just keep an eyeball out and, uh, and watch for it. It'll, it'll get there eventually. Hebrews chapter number 13 tonight. Hebrews chapter 13. If, uh, if we were, looking out the window and we saw pull into the parking lot a there we go if we were looking out the window and saw a white Dodge Charger pull into the parking lot my guess would be the first thing we would do is look at the doors. See if there were any markings on the doors. And if there was, we would know that that's probably the sheriff's department. Why? Because of the markings on the door that identify that white Dodge Charger of the police car. It's not any different for you and I. Say, what are you talking about, Pastor? There are marks that identify Christians. The Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he was talking about was the times that he had been beaten, physically beaten. You see, there was there was a rule that if the executioners, if you will, gave too many strikes, then he was taken into custody and beat with. That's why the Apostle Paul said. Three times, I believe it is, received I 39 stripes, save one. In other words, he'd been sentenced to 40 stripes, but they withheld one just in case that they miscount. Because they didn't want to have to go through that, because they, they understood that that was not a pleasant thing to go through. And Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about his suffering for Christ and that in he wasn't bragging but he's saying in a way he's saying I'm proud to bear in my body these marks that have proven that I love God enough that I'm willing to suffer for him I hope none of us are ever called to suffer for the cause of Christ the sad reality is the day and hour that you and I live in we go knock on somebody's door and they slam the door in our face and well we we put a tick on our gospel gun belt we've suffered for jesus today we're not suffering anything there are people christians around the world that hid today yeah. and were absolutely overjoyed that they had one page out of the Bible to read. They're underground. And yet, today, you and I have freedom to come. We didn't have to sneak in down the creek today because the police had the place blockaded. 
We just drove in the parking lot and picked our favorite parking spots because we're creatures of habit. <laughs> By the way, it helps me know who's here and who's not here. Okay, there are parking spots empty. Uh, every once in a while, y'all fool me, you park someplace else. Good for me. But there's certain, certain marks. When, uh, when I was a police officer, there were certain unspoken rules. You didn't, you didn't let the sergeants take a report. Was it that way for you guys, brother? Why? Because they had rank. And oh my word, you better not let a lieutenant show up on a run, beat you there, have to take a report. Oh boy, you, and you did it when you get back to the station. And you knew who these people were by the rank on their uniform. They were marked. So church, what are the marks of a Christian? It's not always physical marks in our body from where we've been beaten. Because I, truthfully, I don't, I don't imagine any of us have been uh, hailed in and beaten for the cause of Christ. At least not that I know of. But tonight, I want to, I want us to look at Hebrews chapter thirteen, verses one to eight. And I want to look at the supreme marks of Christian conduct. Do when people look at our lives, do they see something different about us? Do they say, that guy or that gal, they're different? And I don't mean odd or weird. There's plenty of those people out there, and some of them name Christ as their Savior. But I'm talking about when people see us, do they see an example of somebody that lives differently because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? So let's Let's pray and we'll jump into Hebrews chapter 13. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for the precious, preserved word of God that we have in the English language, that we can read it, understand it, and memorize it, and know it. Father, I pray that you would bless the service tonight. I pray, Father, tonight that you would help me because there is no way tonight that I am meet for the task at hand. I pray, precious Holy Ghost of God, that you would anoint me with that fresh oil that it takes to make preaching. Give me unction that I might function tonight. Speak through me. Let me be a vessel that you can use tonight. And Father, I pray that when it's all said and done, that we can compare ourselves to the Word of God and see if we line up where we need to line up. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1. The Bible says, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So in, in verse number one, the first mark, supreme mark of Christian conduct is the mark of brotherly love brotherly love there's there's been times in in my christian experience that i have i have thought if that's brotherly love i sure don't want to experience hatred i mean there's i've been i've been in some business meetings in my, during my ministry that if that was brotherly love then i i'll take something else brotherly love is that Philadelphia love. You know, there's all kinds of Bible words for love. I love you folks in one way, but I love her in another way. Right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come up to you in church and give you a big wet sloppy kiss on the cheek. <laughs> and all God's children said, Amen. 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 But I double dog dare you to come between me and the first lady. Because you will see a chihuahua on about six cases of Mountain Dew who hadn't been eaten for three weeks. Come between me and Jonathan and double that. It's a different kind of love. 
is brotherly love is that Philadelphia, like the city, brotherly love. I mean, I love George, he loved to persecute me. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? We have a good time. Actually, we have a great time. And some of you like to persecute me. I mean, we love each other. That's the way it should be. He says, let brotherly love, what? Continue. Continue. That word continue means to abide. That means we're putting down roots and it's not going anywhere. We need to, we need to have brotherly love one toward another. Brother George, not to embarrass you, but my mom told me one time before they went to Texas, she said, Boy, George really loves you, don't he? I don't know why, Mom, but I guess he does. Tried to beat me on devil's eggs, but. <laughs> All I have to do is speak the word. But we're, we're known by our love one for another. I mean, when 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 people when, when when we go to lunch on Sunday after church, and and I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor, okay? But I I know that there's not so much church members here, but I know that there's church members from churches that go out to eat, go out to lunch after church, and they're having roast preacher for lunch. I don't worry about that here. I really don't. Why? Because they, they've let go of that brotherly love. It doesn't abide with them any longer. The marks, the mark of brotherly love, it binds each other together as a family, a brotherly clan. It binds each other in an unbreakable union. It holds each other deeply within the heart. It knows deep affection for each other. It nourishes and nurtures one another. It shows concern and looks after the welfare of each other. It joins hands with each other in a common purpose under one Father. This is a love that abides. It's a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Boy, is brotherly love needed today? Desperately. Days are getting darker and darker, and as they do, we need to love one another deeper and deeper. We need to know that we are loved by one another. I I'm telling you, church, you know as well as I do, if you know that somebody loves you and is praying for you, you'll, you you'll do about anything for somebody, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. Husbands, let's think about this for a second. The Bible tells husbands, love your wife. It doesn't tell the wives to love their husbands. Because men need to be reminded that we need to remind our wives that we love them. Amen. And I'm telling you, man, she'll do anything in her power for you if you let her know that you love her. It can and and the first lady and I joked occasionally, well, I told you I loved you the day we got married, I'll let you know if anything changes. We joked about that. <laughs> But there's people out there with that have that ignorant attitude. You don't you don't know what it does for somebody when they hear you say, "Hey, I just want you to know that I love you." I have a very very close preacher friend, and the first time he told me he loved me, I about fell over because I wasn't used to hearing that. That's why I love it when I. Look at my phone and this brother Tilly called me because every time we part company, every time we hang out the phone together, he always tells me that he loves me. I know it, but it's nice to hear it. And let me say, I'll bet it's the same for every one of us. I'll bet it is. But to some of us, it's strange because we've not heard it. Maybe we grew up in a home where we, our parents didn't tell us that they loved us. 
Maybe we grew up in a home where parents demonstrated the opposite. But the church needs to be different. We need to demonstrate brotherly love, and that needs to be one of our marks. Look at verse 2 with me. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Number two, the second mark of a Christian is hospitality. Hospitality. I, I, it's a stinking shame when Christian people won't get together. Now, I, I understand if you don't want me to come to your house. I get it. We're called to be hospitable. Say that three times fast. We're called to be hospitable. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> An open door is to be the mark of a believer. We're to open the door of our homes to people of like precious faith and fellowship with them. Our home is to be a place of outreach. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but Brother Terry, Miss Sarah, I'll bet you're glad you came to the preacher's house. Yeah. I thought they was coming to have soup. Sitting at our kitchen tables. Miss Sarah begins to tell us, I'm miserable. And I went, well, I guess we're not going to get soup for a minute. <laughs> I live. <laughs> we need to be hospitable to people. Sometimes there's people out there that just need to come and put their feet under your kitchen table whether they get a meal, whether they get a Bible verse, whether they get a cup of coffee or a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh preacher, I don't know enough people in my house. Why? You don't know how many people, when we first got here two years ago, said, well, I've never been in a parsonage. I don't even know what the inside of our parsonage looks like. I said, well, let us get the boxes put up and then come over. We had an open house, nobody came. <laughs> well, that really does a lot for you. But we should be marked by hospitality. Christians should never not be a people person. Mm. I know this would sound odd to you, but there are days when I could be a hermit. There are days I could go in my office and lock the door, and if I had a shade and pull it down, it just gets too peopley outside. That's wrong. Because as a Christian, I've been called to the ministry of hospitality. Hospitality should mark my life. I know that's why he gave me Tara. <laughs> She's a party animal. <laughs> well, in an independent fundamental Baptist kind of way. Oh, yeah. Marks of hospitality. We need to love strangers. Thirdly, we need to see the mark of helping the prisoners and the mistreated. There's something you don't hear much about anymore. That's why I love going to Good News Mission. Those people have been sometimes literally kicked to the curb by society. They feel like nobody loves them. I still remember when we first started going down there, people would ask me, aren't you afraid to go down there? Are you kidding me? I'm not. Yeah, but it's over there on that 
inside of them. They better be afraid of me, not me be afraid of them. Jesus is on my side. You remember, you remember the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that came to suffer, took a towel, put it around his girdle, knelt down, and started washing the stinking nasty feet of those disciples. He knew how to minister to the prisoners and the mistreated. Who do you think he ministered to? If you read your Bible, Jesus does not have anything good to say to the so-called religious people of his day and hour. You know, the, the ones with their noses stuck up in the air, praying it won't rain so that they don't drown. I thought about the Pharisee and the publican. Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as a publican and sinner. Yeah, buddy, you got your reward. This time of year, those folks are who's on people's mind because they want to they want to do their duty. Instead of December 25th, how about, about July 25th? Do we think about those people? Preacher, they can they can get out of the weather in, in July. I don't read in my Bible where the weather has anything to do with it. Amen. One of our marks is that we care for strangers and those mistreated. We should be. As a church, we should be marked by that. He said, them that are in bonds. Bonds literally means a captive. There's people out there that are bound by sin. They're held captive by sin. And yes, what we did this morning is vitally important. But it's just as important that we go right out there and preach repentance and forgiveness of sin so that the people right out there, right in the neighborhood, right next to us, can have their bonds broken by the power of Almighty God and they can be gloriously saved and have eternal life just like us. Are we marked by that? Or do we let it slip? Mark it. Helping prisoners in the mistreated. Look at verse 4. I'm really going to make some friends on this one. Verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Well, that message isn't very popular today, is it? Christians need to be marked by purity in marriage. I'm sick and tired of people today saying, God don't have no business in my bedroom. I've heard it. He don't have no business in my bedroom. Well, let me enlighten you just a little bit. Number one, God instituted marriage. God created sex. And he has every right to tell you what to do and what not to do in your bedroom or any place else that you go. You're welcome. God instituted marriage. He gave us the blueprint for it. And it's our fault because we have thrown the blueprint away and we have made it anything and everything except what he made it to be. There are some countries where, where families are marrying their children to animals. No way. Oh. But they believe in reincarnation. child abuse. We have people in this country that are treating each other like a stinking used car. Well, preacher, I test drive a car before I buy it. We are talking about another human being, not a stinking piece of property. Amen. Amen. Right. 
Right. And I'm going to tell you what, if somebody wants to live with you before they marry you, kick them out and find somebody else. Right. Somebody that values you as a human being. Right. Because if I love somebody, I'm not going to force them to do contrary to what God says ought to be done. Amen. And he says, wait for that relationship within the bonds of marriage. Yes. And oh, by the way, if you're married, stick to your spouse. Yeah. Well, but you have to understand, I just don't love her anymore. I just don't love him anymore. Get over yourself. Love's a choice. I don't like spinach. And I'm not going to make myself eat it until I like it. Nasty, slimy stuff. It's got to be good for you. Now you give me some turnip greens with chopped turnips, a little bit of Hellman's mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. I know half of you are going, oh, preacher. Love is a choice. We choose to love one another. So there is none of this foolishness of I can't love him or her. Say it like it is, I refuse to love him or her. I've heard it, preacher, I just don't love him anymore. Probably not a good thing to say to me in a counseling session. It's a choice. I choose every day when I wake up to love that woman and that young man. And it's true. There is no such thing as that stinking old country song. He's not loving her today. <laughs> Sorry, that was my Willie Nelson imitation. What Willie just sung that? No. Lord help us. We need to be marked by a biblical kind of love. And if we're going to be marked by a biblical kind of love, we have got to start teaching and training younger Christians that it is not right to shack up with one another. It is not right to be giving yourself to one another. It, we have got to teach this younger generation that when they arrive at a marriage altar, that they are to be pure before God. I, I, I cannot tell you how many times you go to a wedding and you know they've been living together. They've got three kids with each other and the bride shows up in a white dress. Give me a can of spray paint. I mean, every girl grows up dreaming of a big church wedding in a flowing white dress. I know y'all do. There's forgiveness when we slip up, when we sin. But let's quit pretending to be what we're not. He said, warmongers and adulterers. word whoremongers, the original word is pornos, where well, we get our English word pornography. Also a male prostitute. This stuff shouldn't mark the life of a Christian. No. And I'm sad to say, but one of the fastest growing problems in the church today is pornography. Mm -hmm. And it's not just us guys. Warmongers, adulterers. That word adulterers, it means exactly what you think it does, but it also means apostate. Ugh. 
pretty strong, pretty strong words he's using here. These things can not mark the life of a Christian. They can't. Because the world is dying and going to hell. And they're, they're, they want to see something different in us. They're dying to see something different about us. What are we showing them? The scary reality of it is, he says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That word judge means to distinguish, to decide, to condemn, to punish. There's a day coming. There's a reckoning day coming. And it's not going to be pleasant. God will judge. Number five, we see the mark of contentment. Contentment. Are, are we content? Or are we like, I think it was Rockefeller, one of those millionaires, billionaires of, of old, somebody asked him, how much would it take to make you happy? And he said, just a little bit more. That is not contentment. Contentment. The Apostle Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. We need to be content with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe we don't we don't live in a palace for a home. Maybe we don't drive a sixty thousand dollar Dodge four door V twelve turbo diesel with the light kit on the undercarriage, <laughs> chrome exhaust pipe. Maybe we need to be content to go out to the garage and hop in that Toyota Camry that's got 314,502 miles and had a payment book in 12 years. Every time you turn the key, it still starts. Content. Maybe, maybe we ought to be content with our relationship. Contentment is being free of covetousness. Oh, I like that. I want that. Oh, I like that. I want that. Oh, I like those. I want some of those. I want, I want, I want, I want. What do we need? What do we need? Content. The Bible tells us godliness with contentment is great gain. Number six, we need to have the mark of remembering our leaders. Remember means to mention, to remind, or to remember. And it is always in connection with prayer. We need to be remembering and praying for our leaders. Not just me as the pastor, our governmental leader, whoever God places in leadership over us, we, we should be praying for them. And, and I feel me. I think it's, oh, I can never remember if it's Psalm 107 or 109. That psalm is actually written about Judas Iscariot. Let his wife be a widow. Let his children be fatherless. Let another take his office. Somebody thought they'd be cute and make bumper stickers about right after an election a few years ago. Pray for your president and listed those verses. That was a great testimony, wasn't it? I mean, I have to admit, I laughed at first until I read what that scripture said. It's like, that's not a good testimony. Maybe we should pray that they get right with God and get saved. Amen. Yeah. Wouldn't that be refreshing? 
to have some legislators that actually knew Christ as their Savior. And he led like it. The mark of remembering our leaders. Number seven, and lastly, we need to be, one, a mark of a Christian is remembering your source of life and power. The source of your strength is Christ. Verse eight, he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He is immutable. He never changes. There's some people, you know, you have to kind of watch them as they come down the hallway, see if they've had their coffee yet, you know whether to talk to them or not, because you don't know what you're going to get. But you don't have to worry about that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same in the past. He's immutable. He does not change. He's the same in the present and today. That means on this day or night, currently, right now, he is omnipresent. He is present everywhere at all times, period. Yesterday, today, and the future, forever. Forever is an age or an era. Perpetually, he is eternally the same. He never changes. Right. Well, we change, don't we? Yeah. Our hair turns color, sometimes it turns loose. <laughs> Our belt gets tighter or looser. I've never known anybody to get taller, but sometimes we get shorter. We change. But he never changes. And one of the one of the marks of a Christian is knowing the source of our power. In other words, we're not out here spinning our wheels. We're not doing like Frank Sinatra and Elvis. We're not doing it my way. We're doing it his way. Because God's work done in God's will will bring about God's blessing done in God's power. I don't have the power to do it, but he does. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That word consumed means to end, to cease, to be finished. I am the Lord, I change not. What he did in the past, he can do now, and he can do it in the future. Right. Remember, our lives should be marked by the power of God, not our own power. So tonight, as we look at our own lives, what's marking my life? What's marking your life? Many times, when we would enter people into the computer system, whether they were missing or wanted, there was one field that we had to fill in. SMT. Scars, marks, tattoos. Helps to identify people. Sometimes we're identified by our scars. Jesus was identified by the scars on his side, the nail prints in his hand. How are you and I being identified tonight? What identifies us? What marks us? And this is, church, this is a short list. There's so much more in the Bible that marks us as his child. How are we doing tonight? Let's stand to our feet, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.